The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today what we want to do is focus more explicitly on bacterial chemotaxis. Of course, uh, the discussion that we had on Thursday about life at low Reynolds numbers is, is certainly very relevant to this question of how bacteria uh, are maybe able to find food or what constraints they're faced in trying to solve this problem. Today we're going to uh, discuss in more depth this idea of the biased random walk that runs and tumbles that we talked about on Thursday that allow bacteria to uh, swim towards attractants and away from repellents. But in particular, there's something that is, uh, is, is rather subtle about the particular biased random walk that bacteria implement. Right? Now, the way that you might kind of naively imagine that this thing would work is that you would just have this tumbling frequency be a function of uh, the concentration of the attractant, for example. Right? And that indeed would allow you to, to swim, or to execute a bias run walk towards, say, food sources, towards attractants. But it would not be effective over a very wide range of concentrations. Okay. However, if you experimentally ask how well can bacteria swim towards attractants, it turns out that they can respond over five orders of magnitude of concentration of these attractants, which is really quite incredible if you think about uh, the, the, the engineering challenge that uh, these, you know, these little one micron cells are able to, uh, to overcome. Right? And, and the basic way that they do this is they implement uh, what's essentially equivalent to integral feedback in the context of engineering, where it turns out that the steady state tumbling frequency, right, so the frequency with which they execute one of these tumbles that randomizes their motion, okay, that displays what's known as perfect adaptation. It's not a function of the concentration of uh, the, of the, you know, the constant, con you know, the, if you have a constant concentration of an attractant, then it's not a function of, of that. Of course, changes in concentrations it responds to, but somehow, E. coli uh, and, ma and many other microorganisms are able to implement this, uh, this very clever thing where uh, the steady state uh, frequency of, of tumbling, of changing direction, is, is somehow not a function of the overall attractant concentration. Okay. All right. Now that's already an interesting, I think, phenomenon. Uh, and it's, it's, it's in some ways, you can think of it as some kind of robustness, because there is a, some way in which this tumbling frequency is robust against and kind of constant changes in the level of, of attractants. Right? And it's that aspect that I think it makes this example both rather subtle but also quite confusing because it's the phenomenon of perfect adaptation that already has some aspects of robustness, but it's this phenomenon of perfect adaptation that is robust against changes in concentrations of proteins. For example, uh, the concentration of the protein key R that we're going to talk about. And so I think that this is, in some ways, maybe the prettiest example that we have of uh, of uh, this principle of robustness, but I think it's also in some ways the most tricky to get to kind of wrap your head around because it's sort of robustness of a robustness in, uh, in, in some ways. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's. Um, so our, our goal for today is going to be to to make to make sure that we understand the the challenge that E. coli are facing, and then to try to understand the uh, genetic circuit that they use in order to uh, overcome this challenge. Okay. So what I'm going to do for the next hour, 15 minutes, is uh, I'm, we're going to leave this network up on the board so that, uh, so that any time that you're confused about what is R, B, Z, Y, so forth, uh, you can kind of look up here and remind yourself what this thing is. Right. And, uh, and hope, but hopefully, the, the reading from, uh, from last night will, will help you in uh, in following what's going on. There are a fair number of letters, uh, I will uh, admit it. OK, okay. all right, so, what, um, so first I, I want to make sure that we're all kind of remembering the, the basic phenomenon that, that we, um, we're trying to study, which is this idea of uh, consecutive runs and tumbles. Okay, so the, this random walk is really composed of what you might call or what we do call uh, kind of runs, where the bacteria go sort of straight, and then tumbles, in which they randomize their motion. Okay, so this is runs and tumbles. Okay. Right, where bacteria they kind of go semi-straight, right, for uh, of order a second. 
good. Order one second. Uh, then they, uh, and this is, this is the run. Then they have this tumbling that might last about one second. So a 0 0.1 second tumble um, over which uh, the motion is, uh, is sort of random in, in this axis of, you know, of the orientation. And then they kind of go in a new direction, and then tumble again, and then new direction, and so forth. Okay. So it's runs uh, followed by tumbles. Okay. Okay. Now, the thing that changes depending on whether the cells are sensing that they're moving up or down, say, an attractant gradient, is the frequency of those tumbles, i.e., how, how long are the runs? Right, I said that they're around one second, but uh, they will, uh, th this will vary depending upon whether uh, bacteria sense that, they're, that things are getting better or things are getting worse. Okay. All right, can somebody remind us how the, uh, how the bacteria actually execute one of these uh, tumble motions? Yes? They have this, uh, all their motors, they have mini motors? In yes. They usually all spin one way, which is counterclockwise. That's right. I always have trouble. You're right. So the runs are indeed when these things are rotating counterclockwise. Yeah, and right. then one of them can decide to switch and start turning clockwise. And That's right. Does, it just sort of, I don't know. I just imagine yeah. it throws the whole motor out. Exactly. Of well, right, and, and, and in particular, the, the flagella, in, in the context of, all right, so we have our E. coli. The velocity was, you know, is of order, say, 30 microns per second. Uh, now, they have these flagella that are actually distributed, the, the motors are actually distributed across the entire cell. So it's not just on the back. But then these individual filaments kind of come together towards the back, and then they have this corkscrew shape, when these things are all rotating in the counterclockwise direction, that corresponds to a run, right, when there's directed motion. But then if one of them goes uh, clockwise, this, uh, th the, the bundle kind of falls apart. And indeed, there are some very nice movies online where you can see that in this, when they're going clockwise, you see that the flagella are kind of doing crazy things. And that causes this thing to kind of tumble in a, in a random orientation. So it randomizes its, its direction. Now, one thing that we did not talk about in the context of this low Reynolds number um, motion was the question of how hard you would have to pull in order to get a cell to go 30 microns per second. Okay. Now, uh, remember we're in the low Reynolds number regime, where uh, the force you have to apply is, in general, proportional to this velocity. And this thing is very much not a sphere. Okay? But if it were a sphere, you know, for, for a sphere, the proportionality constant is this 6 pi eta a v, where a here is, again, the radius. Okay. Now, uh, regardless of the precise shape, you'll always get, for the low Reynolds uh, regime, something that looks vaguely like this, where this is going to be the longest linear dimension. And uh, this here depends on the precise geometry of the object. Right? All right so just, uh, it's, it's useful to try to get a sense of order of magnitude. You know, how large are these forces that we're talking about? Okay. In particular, uh, how, how hard would you have to pull this, a cell in order to get it to go 30 microns per second. Okay. Now, just to, you know, of course, then, you know, there's a question, you know, what's roughly the scale that we should be thinking about? Right now, a Newton is the scale that's kind of for macroscopic objects. So you'd say, OK, probably not going to be up that large. Right? And then the, on the other scale, we can think about the forces that can be um, applied or exerted by individual uh, molecular motors. Does any, has, anybody, uh, has anybody studied this at all? 
where I order picanuns. Okay. So force for a molecular motor is uh, going to be uh, of order picanuns. Okay. Now uh, it you can there's a simple way to kind of get at why this might actually be. Okay. Because uh, what is it that powers many of these molecular motors? So it could, yeah, so it's often you know, you're thinking of maybe the uh, the motors that operate in a membrane, right? And then there there might be some difference in uh, in a gradient, you know, or there's so a difference in concentration across that membrane, and that can actually power, for example, rotation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the context of the flagellar motor because this is one of uh, only a few known uh, rotary motors. All right, so I'll, since okay, I'm just going to write this down so that I don't forget to say something about it. Okay, uh, all right, but. Um, Right, but in this case, ATP, right? So in many cases, what happens is that you have, for example, kinesin or myosin. You know, these are motors that walk along some track. And, 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 and in many cases, each step corresponds to a single ATP being hydrolyzed. Okay. All right, so that, given that, there's some like, maximal force that you can imagine such a motor applying. Okay, so for example, and what, is it, what might it depend upon? Right. Oh, very good. Okay, so we have delta G for say ATP, right? And there's going to be a length scale, right? And what's going to be the relevant length scale in the case of, for example, a motor like kinesin? Okay, well, kinesin is not walking along the flagella, but you know, in, in this case, uh, right? Kinesin is walking walking along microtubules, for example, right? So what's what? You know, it's, it, you're right that we need a length scale because this is going to have some units of say piconewton nanometers. Oops, that's an NM, right? And we want to get a piconewton, so we're going to need a length scale to divide by, right? And so how long we move each time? That's right. It's kind of the distance that this thing is moving, right? So indeed, what happens in the case of, of kinesin is that you know they take steps with what are called heads, but they're, we can think of them as feet if we want, right? So each each step is is in this case eight nanometers, right? So for example, delta L for uh, for kinesin. Uh, is, is equal to eight nanometers. You don't need to know this, but just it's useful to have some sense of scale, right? You know, and of course, delta G of uh, of ATP. This depends upon uh, the concentrations of uh, the reactants of the products and so forth, right? But this thing might be of order a hundred piconewton nanometers. Right? All right, so. Um, you know, depending on conditions, maybe it's 70, you know, but of order here. Right? And indeed, what this tells us is that just based on what we've said right now, you know, even without building any fancy microscopes to measure how much force these things can apply, you can see that the maximum force that could possibly apply would be something on the order of delta G divided by uh, the length that it's pulling. Okay? Otherwise, it's going to be, otherwise it could, you could generate, make a, a perpetual motion machine. Right? You know, and so this, well, and maybe what we'll do, if we want to make our math simpler, we can say this is around 80. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's of order there. But the point is that this is of order 10 piconewtons. So, OK, so it's kind of piconewton scale. OK? All right, so given this, it's interesting to ask, how hard would you have to pull? Right, so and, you know, how big is gonna, a kinesin molecule going to be, this protein? Yeah, right. About eight nanometers. Of course, it's kind of a long, spindly things like you know my skinny legs, right? But you know, it's you know it's indeed going to be around you know around that scale, right? Whereas the the cell is you know one micron wide, multiple microns long, so much much larger. Okay, we'll draw a little. You know, here's a kinesin in there. All right, it's even smaller than that. Okay, kinesin small, right? So, okay. Now the question is, uh, how much force would you have to apply in order to pull? an E. coli at 30 microns a second. Okay. Force to, um, to pull E. coli at the speed that it's actually observed to go. Okay. Now, you're unlikely going to be able to do the calculation right here. It's, it's actually a simple calculation. We, we could do it in a moment. But uh, it's useful to just kind of imagine you know, what scale might it be. All right. So we'll 
right, this is a way of, uh, we can go up as high as we want. OK. Uh, you can continue it on. Uh, and this is all in units of picanutons, right? All right, so I just, it's, it's, once again, it's useful to, to make guesses about your intuition of these things just so you have uh, some notion of, of where, where we might be. Yeah, and of course, you know, in this case, nobody wants to guess anything, right? Because they feel, um, all right, I'll give you 10 seconds just to you know, make your best guess. You know, somebody's forcing you to do it. In this case, it's me. Uh, no reason that you actually should necessarily get this. Right? But, all right, pulling through water. Right? Uh, yeah, At 30 microns per second. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's 10 to the minus 9 in the units of picanewton nanometer second something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, OK, now I've given you enough time. You should have just been able. Now I'm going to be disappointed if you don't get it right. No. <laughs> uh, all right, let's just see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. OK, so I'd say that we have a bunch of, I'd say the mean is kind of a CD ish. We got some ABs. Um, all right, so I'd say it's somewhere in the sense of, yeah, maybe it's 100,000, you know. All right, so maybe if you, you, know, if you had a, you know, 100 of these kinesins pulling you along, then you'd be able to go 30 microns a second. Although, you have to be careful because kinesin can't actually go that fast. But, you know, I mean, you know, these are details, right? Uh, no, but there, there's a, just a reasonable question. How hard would you have? How hard would you have to pull? You know, and of course, if we want, we could actually just do the calculated equations here, right? Uh, the force, you know, it's around 20 in units of picanewton nanometer seconds. I told you that the eta is around 10 to the minus 9. All right. The radius, what radius do you want to use? Micron. Yeah, micron. OK, so do we write a 1 here or do we write what? 10 to the 3, because I already told you that this was in units of where everything is picanewton nanometer seconds. And velocity, this is, again, per second. So this is 3 times 10 to the 4, right? Because that that's how many nanometers per second, right? And this gets us to around, OK, that's 10 to 7. We have to, we're going to have to divide by 100. So this is 60 divided by 100. OK, All right, so less than, you know, less than a picanewton. All right, so this is really pretty, pretty surprising, right? But, and again, this is, this is a reflection of, uh, the wonders of low Reynolds numbers kind of behavior. So uh, it's, uh, it's somewhere here. Yes? So since there are many like, flagella, is it telling us, like, uh, what's really what's it, sorry, is it telling us that they're very inefficient compared to this bound? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, right? So uh, I think there, there are several ways. And th this is one aspect, maybe, of what, um, what we read about in the, the life of low Reynolds number, you know, that, the, the comparison was to uh, uh, Dotson and Saudi Arabia. Of course, I think that this was, this was written in the 70s where that meant something. But I think that um, a Dotson, I guess, is a fuel efficient car. All right, well, um, yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was my inference from that. Uh, and you know, Saudi Arabia has a lot of oil, still true. Okay. Um, right, uh, you know, and so I think, you know, and, and the, the, the same was that it might only be 1% efficient or so, right? But, if, if you don't have to apply very much force there, then maybe that's not a disaster. Uh, the, the swimming speed is not actually a super strong function of the number of flagella that are there, as far as is my understanding. So I, I, I'm actually a little bit conf you know, there are, yeah, I mean, there are cases where you do get somewhat higher speed with more flagella. Although I have to, I have to confess, actually, just the geometry of the multiple flagella I find totally mystifying, because I would have thought that they would get tangled up. Right, because each of them goes in and they form a corkscrew. I don't know; it just doesn't seem that it should work. <laughs> but um, but it does, so I'm not I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna argue that it doesn't. Right? Um, yeah. No. I, my compl my concern is not even the matter of the low Reynolds number or not. It's just a matter of you know they're each spinning, right? And then. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, this is something I've really, I've, I've never understood, so I, I typically uh, avoid talking about it. 
But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just feel like there's something wrong, right? But OK, um, I, in any case, you don't need to pull very hard in order to get uh, even uh, a micron size object to, um, to go rather fast. Yes? Do you know it's probably special structure? Oh, uh, I'm not aware. But this thing is that can actually go, it's like 10 microns long. So it's a, this thing is it's huge, actually. Uh, yeah, but I. I probably just a reason. Like, probably just chop it up. Or it, it is a reason you need to connect it. I don't know. I just couldn't find it. It wasn't. It seems like that. Yeah, yeah, right. So I, I don't know, but I, I'm not even sure if that would necessarily address my concern, which is it seems like they have to get go through each other. But I, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not true, so I don't want to make the argument too strongly, right? But did you have a question? So I, I was just thinking about this because this is confusing me too. Might it be possible that they, um, if they all sync up their rotations, then it doesn't matter how tangled they are? Yeah, no, even, I, <laughs> even if they're all spinning at the exact same rate, I still feel that they should get tangled, but it's a feeling that is apparently not true. So I, I, I don't want to. Uh, but if they're always tumbling, maybe the time to. No, 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 no. Because wait, so the, it's not, you know, they, they, right, OK, no. I think that the tumble is not due to my, my supposed mechanism. I mean, they're, they're, they're spinning at something like 100 hertz. You know, the, the motors are spinning at something like 100 hertz, right? So in principle, if they were going to get tangled, they would have gotten tangled. Time is much shorter. That's right, that's right. Um, OK. Now, yeah, right. I, I do want to just come back and, and say one thing about this, this question of a, of a rotary motor, right? Because uh, it's, it's a fascinating question. Oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I just had a quick question. What was the unit of beta again? Oh, I mean, uh, it, it's, <laughs> right. I mean, this is the thing. Every time I, the units of eta, I always just go back here and I say, OK, well, it's the units of a force divided by unit of an area, or sorry, of a radius, unit of a velocity, right? And then I, I, and then I have to, Plug everything in, and you know, and then I, you know, and they have to find an equation with a force, other than this equation, because if you put this equation back in, then you don't get anywhere. <laughs> right. I, I, these are useful. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, you know, you, I always, I always have to actually figure it out fresh each time. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So it turns out that these are indeed rotary motors, and uh, and I think that this was actually. The, um, these are the f this is the first, as far as I'm aware, it's the first example of a rotary motor um, in biology that had been demonstrated, okay. which is uh, a fascinating idea because, you know, in, in human engineering, rotary motors are everywhere, right? Yet somehow, if you look at if you look at living things, they don't seem to have have rotary motors. Now, uh, uh, anybody want to suggest why rotary motors might be rare in biology, in life? Maybe the rotary gets the magnetic rotating direction, not in terms of the mechanism by which it happens. Because there's also like rotary engines. Well, I guess I'm thinking of something that can continuously rotate, right? I mean, it's true that if you look at, I mean, we have ball socket joints, right? But you know, I, and I can rotate them a little bit. Right, but certainly, I you know I can't go. There are there are limits, right? So the, and and this is a pretty striking difference between human engineering and and you know biological engineering. Right? Yeah. If you would try to connect anything across this motor. That's right. It, that's right. The problem is that you just can't have anything connected across it. Otherwise, you really do get tangled, right? Uh, now, the question then is, well, why is it that it's possible to do that here, then? Because we're at such a small scale that we're not thinking of connecting anything else. Like, we're um, individual molecules anyway. Like, there's nothing that yeah. can go through that. Yeah, it's interesting, right? You know, and, and this is how I think about it, right? That, you know, well, at the molecular scale, you just have some rotary something, and it, you know, and it's just, it doesn't have to be attached via, say, covalent bonds or whatnot. Uh, and you can then you know, force something to rotate. Of course, it's a little bit funny because in, you know, the, this, this issue about connecting across this rotation, that, that should be a problem for human engineering as well. But somehow we do get around it. Uh, I guess what I would say is uh, I don't have any deep 
comments, except for uh, this was then um, quite a surprise when, when it was discovered that this was a rotor motor, just because uh, we had not seen any in, in other uh, in sort of macroscopic living things. So then uh, it, was, it was quite kind of exciting to, to see it in the case of, of, of the flagellar motor. And uh, in your book, you'll see that there, there's a very nice kind of uh, EM reconstruction of this motor. And you can see how it's hinged. And it, it's powered by uh, proton gradients that kind of cause this thing to rotate. I mean, it's, it's an, really a beautiful, amazing thing. Okay. Uh, does anybody know any other examples of, of rotary motors? And um, that's right. The other, the other really famous one is the FOF1 ATP synthase, uh, which is, again, uh, something that's across a membrane and, uh, and has, uh, once again, a really, a really beautiful structure where it has this circular thing in the membrane that, that rotates in response to, again, a proton gradient. And then that drives rotation of this other part of the protein, the F1. And then that makes, uh, that makes ATP. And uh, that motor is, is amazing also because it's, it's reversible and that, uh, and that you can also, uh, the cell can also uh, burn ATP and, and drive a proton uh, gradient. Uh, and indeed, uh, in, in some single molecule experiments, they've even done something where they attached, uh, they attached a little, uh, little magnetic particle onto this F1 and then and rotated themselves. And they showed that they could actually, uh, they could actually uh, make ATP. And right, it wasn't, you know, it was, you know, the efficiency was maybe not great, something like that, right? You know, they're rotating a, a macroscopic magnet and then they're making ATPs there. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's, it's a pretty remarkable uh, aspect of of these molecular motors. Now, in, in this class, we don't really, we're not going to say anything more about molecular motors. Uh, but I just wanted to mention a few things about them because they're they're really uh, they're fun, uh, beautiful things, and uh, there are other classes that uh, that are at MIT that may give you an opportunity to think about them some more. Okay. Any any question about where we are now? So what is the common motor from the common motor? Oh, OK. Well, you know, I'd say that the, the other class of motors that, uh, that are seen a lot in the context of these, these molecular motors are motors that travel along linear tracks. Right? So there's, uh, there's kinesin that walks along microtubules. Uh, there, are, there are various myosins that walk, walk on actin. And then, of course, DNA and RNA polymerase, uh, we don't normally think of them as motors. But indeed, they take uh, an energy fuel, and, uh, and then they they, they have to walk along the template as they as they make either the DNA or the RNA. Right? So there, uh, so I'd say there are many many examples of molecular motors that uh, that convert uh, chemical energy into mechanical forces in motion, in particular along uh, one one dimensional tracks. So those are I think the, the best well, uh, the most well studied examples. Now, one way to study this run and tumble motion is, of course, to actually apply a gradient and then watch the cells as they swim. And that, uh, that has been done. Uh, a lot's been learned from that kind of assay. But, uh, but it turns out that there are two other assays that uh, may be allowed for more controlled uh, analysis of, uh, of this chemotaxis kind of response. Right? Right, so okay, let's just say, OK, so studying chemotaxis. So the, the most obvious thing to do is to you know, apply a gradient uh, and then watch. Right. Okay. Um, and in, you know, indeed, the, the classic assays where you add uh, a little pipette with, uh, with either an attractant or repellent and watch the bacteria swim toward or away, that demonstrates there is indeed chemotaxis. Right. But it's a little bit difficult to quantify that process in many cases. Right. So what, uh, what are the assays that? Uh, that maybe you've you've read about recently. In yeah, in, in the in Uri's book, how is it that they actually analyzed this perfect adaptation? Yes. Right. So one thing is that you can do is you can um, you can I may 
put it here. All right, so you can um, you can kind of attach uh, attach the cell to uh, to a slide. Um, and typically, you attach it to the slide by what? This is, and this, it doesn't matter where you attach the cell to the slide. Yeah, so you typically attach it via this, this hook that's at the edge. Yeah, so by some part of the flagella, right? Um, to the slide by, uh, by the flagella, we'll say. Flagellum, flagellum. OK, whatever. Uh, Right, and the, the nice thing there is that as the cell is doing its thing uh, and it's spinning either clockwise or counterclockwise, you can directly visualize that because the cell, whole cell is moving. Okay. Uh, and, and the cell that is, is, is both uh, the thing that is doing the work, right, and processing the signals and everything, but it's also kind of your, your marker for what the state of, the, of this, this little hook is, right? So this is uh, a wonderfully uh, quantitative assay where you can uh, you get high time resolution. It's easy to do the image analysis. Uh, and then how do, you, uh, how do you typically get this cell to change its, for example, tumbling frequency? Attractive. Right, so you, you can add, a, add an attractive. And indeed, I, I, I just wanted to separate this a little bit because you can, even without doing this, this is kind of the next order step, but you can just add an attractant. Um, and mix, okay. So you want to kind of because you don't want the spatial patterns, right? But a nice thing here, this is a gradient in space, and then you can watch the bacteria swim. Or, but you can also have the equivalent of maybe like a gradient in time, and the cells can't tell the difference. The nice thing here is that you can then just add the attractant mix, and then you just watch all the cells as they're going. You don't need to kind of try to follow them or whatnot, uh, but you can just look to see how the tumbling frequency changes over time. And of course, you can you would typically use this trick together with this in order to get in order to study perfect adaptation and so forth. Right? And if you uh, if you collect this sort of data and you plot the uh, the tumbling frequency, uh, as a function of time, right? What you might see is that it starts out at uh, one per second. All right, now, if at this time I add an attractant, right, does the tumbling frequency go up or down? And we're going to do a verbal answer. Ready? Three, two, one. Down. down right? And that makes sense because the cells think that they're moving up an attractant gradient. Right? So over a very short time scale, Tumbling frequency goes down, but then um, over a time scale of minutes, you know, I, I, you know, it might be five, ten minutes, the, that tumbling frequency goes back to where it started. And I just want right, to, you know, this varies, but this could be order ten minutes. Yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's a long time scale. Right, it, it's and here's a question: Is it because this is the time that it takes to make new protein? Okay, right. New protein synthesis, we'll say. I'm saying, uh, is 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 this is this the explanation for why this is ten minutes? Because you have to the cell has to um, go make new protein in order to do this. I mean, right? So the cell is presumably going to be making some new protein, but is this the uh, the what you would really just describe as being the causative agent of this thing taking 10, 20 minutes? All right, ready? Okay, three, two. One. All right, so I'd say most people are agreeing that actually, yes, yeah, so it, it is, the answer is no. This is not, uh, it may be the case that the cell is making new protein, but that, this is not 
what's setting the, the time scale there. Right. Is, uh, okay, right. <laughs> yeah, you, you agreed that, that was the answer, but you didn't, yeah. Uh, well, okay, so I would say on a con uh, there, there are several ways you can think about this, but one, okay, we're going to go through the, the model that is supported by, I think, a fair amount of experimental evidence. But the, the key feature there is that in, in this model, it works even if, uh, even if all the protein concentrations are constant over time. All right, so everything that's happening in this network is happening uh, as a result of changes of the states of the protein. Right, so proteins are either getting methylated or phosphorylated, and that, you know, on these, uh, uh, right. Okay. Yeah, but then of course it's a question of why is it 10 minutes instead of, you know, 10 seconds or a minute or uh, yeah. Yeah, and, I mean you need a yeah. rate in there that's on the order of minutes, like one over minutes, which is very slow. Like yeah, I I don't. Uh, well, okay. There one question is, is um, is this. This is what is called the adaptation time. Right? Now, is this a robust feature in this model? Or in, in the cells, for that matter? All right, we'll just add verbal, yes or no. Ready, three, two, one. No. no. Okay. Now, um, and then what that means is that indeed, uh, different kind of versions of this network will have different times. And there is, there is data looking at, looking at variation in this between different cells. You know, and I guess, right, I don't have a clear feeling for what would be optimal in the sense of allowing op, you know, optimal climbing up of a attracting gradient. You know, it, this thing has to be much longer than the typical times for a, um, for, for a tumble. Other, otherwise, it's not even kind of well, we wouldn't have been able to measure it, I guess. Uh, but I, I, it, yeah, I agree that it could have been one minute, and I wouldn't have batted an eye, right? In the sense that it, I don't have any feeling for why it had to have been this or something else. Uh, but you know, somebody who actually studies this might be able to give a better answer. All right. But I guess, sorry, just one last thing. My question is not that why it's been there. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that there are different ways of looking at this, and then depending on how you look at it, you either feel surprised or not. So it's a little um, okay. Now, on, on the other hand, uh, if you had added a repellent, then the uh, tumbling frequency would actually go up, and then and then come back down. Okay. But the uh, the key key thing in this um, in this system that we want to focus our attention on is the fact that it comes back where it started. Right. So it's, it's the fact that I could draw this dashed line that is this perfect adaptation. And, uh, and so we, what we want to do is understand where this phenomenon of perfect adaptation comes from and, uh, and maybe why it is robust to uh, changes in, for example, the concentrations of some of these proteins. Now, all right, let's just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what's, what was known about this uh, chemotaxis network. And uh, I think it, it's worth mentioning, perhaps, here that uh, this ho the whole series of studies of bacterial chemotaxis um, Going back to Howard Berg and company, and then later uh, the studies that in robustness that Uri Lone and Stan Leibler and Nama Barkai did, I think they represent really just a wonderfully beautiful exploration of at the interface between physics and biology. I think you could teach uh, an entire course just on bacterial chemotaxis, and you could hit pretty much all the major thing, themes in biophysics over the last over the last 40 years. Right? It's uh, it's, it's, really, it's really amazing to me. I myself have not done any work in the field, but uh, from afar, I've really just admired uh, the beauty of, of, all, of all these studies. And uh, you know, because you go back to Howard, Howard Berg and, and Purcell, and they're thinking about 
you know, how simple physics can inform uh, the, the challenges the bacteria are facing, uh, how uh, cells are actually able to do a biased random walk and get anywhere, uh, limits on sensing both concentrations and, and, and gradients. And then later, the, the, the studies that, well, the, this topic of robustness, I think it's really a wonderful example where uh, Nama Barkai, when she was a postdoc with Stan Leibler, uh, they published uh, a Nature paper in maybe, I think, 97, uh, basically saying, all right, this idea of robustness is really important in biology. And in order to have a robust uh, response of perfect adaptation, uh, you, you know, a model has to have these features. Uh, so there's no, uh, no experiments there, but they, it was, their model was guided by previous observations that people had made. Right? Uh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then two years later, Uri, when he was a postdoc uh, in Stan's lab again, uh, did the, kind of the experimental kind of confirmation of the model, where he went in and he uh, controlled the concentration of key R and showed that the, these key predictions of the model, i.e. that perfect adaptation would be robust to the concentration, but that the tumbling uh, frequency and the adaptation time they would not be robust to key R concentrations. They would move in the way predicted by the model. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really amazing that it all kind of holds together. Because uh, in many cases, we do the modeling uh, kind of uh, post facto, right? And then you know, it's kind of explaining our results. But in many, you know, the, the case where a model is really useful is when it makes new predictions that get you to go make new measurements. Okay? And this is a situation where uh, it's always, there are an infinite number of experiments that you could do. Uh, but only some of them will actually provide you kind of deep insight into the mechanisms that are going on in the system. And I think this was a real case where uh, the models made some really clear predictions, and that allowed, uh, in this case, Uri to go and, and make, you know, make the strains that allowed him to test uh, the predictions of the model. And, and I think it's really it's amazing that it all it all kind of works. Okay. All right. Now, all of the letters that you see up there, uh, they're not actually. Well, first of all, the letters are somehow real. Okay, they, they, this is the real names of um, the, the protein components in the chemotaxis network in E. coli and, and largely in, in other organisms. But uh, in, in each case, it, it, it's, it's, there's a key that comes in front. Right? So R corresponds to key R, for example. You know, and then there's uh, key B, key W, key A. And, and these are all identified by, by genetics. Right? So then uh, by uh, researchers looking for mutants, that were, uh, that were uh, defective in, in chemotaxis. Right? Uh, I don't know what happened to like C, D, E, F, G, because you know, it does seem like the, you know, we got the first part of the alphabet and the last part of the alphabet. Uh, I don't know. Uh, all right. Now, the, the basic idea in this, uh, in this system is that you have uh, key W slash A that we often here will refer to as X, just for simplicity. Now, uh, these are uh, proteins in the membrane. Okay? So they have a binding kind of pocket outside that will allow binding of, uh, of attractants or repellents. Okay? And there uh, might be, as uh, say, five different kinds of these uh, receptor complexes that can sense that bind at different rates, different kinds of attractants or repellents. And then, and then the signal is somehow integrated. Okay? Uh, now, uh, this could be either an attractant or a repellent. The distinction between these two is that uh, we, get, we get different levels of um, methylation on, uh, onto key W. Okay. Now, in, in, in this lecture, we're only going to be talking about kind of like the methylated state versus the unmethylated. But, uh, but in reality, depending on the receptor complex, they, have, they might have four or five different methylation sites. Okay. And uh, this ability to switch between different methylation states is really uh, at the heart of uh, the phenomenon of uh, robust perfect adaptation. Okay. But what we can think, what the, the base feature then, though, is that uh, key A can uh, phosphorylate key Y. And key Y will then go and, and yield the output, which is, in this case, uh, increased uh, tumbling frequency. Okay. But there are lots of other bells and whistles that you can see on here. Right? So of course, it's not just that this um, phosphorylated key Y just kind of com you know, the f comes off on its own, but rather uh, it's actively done by key Z. Right? So there's a constant cycling here. And again, there's a constant cycling here where the methyl groups are taken off and then put, in ba uh, put back on. Right? So there's, if you look at this, you really do feel that it's, it's rather wasteful because there's a huge number of these feudal cycles going on. Right? Key Y is always kind of being phosphorylated and then uh, dephosphorylated. 
right? And and this is all um, you know this is all going to be costly to the cell, right? So uh, you can imagine then uh, the only reason it's there is because it's doing something useful. Okay. Uh, now there was a comment in the uh, in the chapter about what is the rate limiting step in in all of this, and uh, can somebody remember what it was? Right, so one okay, all right, this is okay. So okay, so methylation, there is a sense that that is actually the longest time scale, but I guess um, because that that the methylation is what results in this thing coming in the perfect adaptation over this time is ten minutes. I guess what I meant, yeah, so that is the longest time scale, and but I guess what I was thinking about rate limiting is the sense of when uh, the cell finds itself in a new environment, it tr it changes its state over. Uh, a much shorter time scale. The, you know, so this thing I drew is almost vertical, right? So there's a set, so this question is if the cell finds itself in a new environment suddenly, all right, and then it just it really wants to tumble, right? So you know, okay, it finds itself, you know, you find yourself in a crappy bar. How long does it take for you to get out, right? Now, you know, what what's going to be rate limiting there? Yeah. Okay, phosphorylation. Yeah. Although it, it turns out that's not the uh, that's not the rate limiting step. Right. And, and this actually comes back a little bit to something that we talked about in the first part of the class, that uh, in these transcription networks, the characteristic time scale is what? Right. Oh, okay, yeah, so, all right, so, the character, yeah, so the characteristic time scale in the case of uh, transcription networks is the time it takes for you to change concentrations of proteins, which is kind of cell generation time. Or if you have active degradation, you might be able to make it faster. Okay. Whereas all of this is happening rather quickly, you say, maybe, maybe a tenth of a second. And a lot of these, these kinds of processes, binding, unbinding, and actually even the interactions between the proteins can take place you know, even maybe faster than that. Right? So the, the, the actual rate limiting step for the, when the cell finds itself in a bad environment for it to start tumbling is actually due to diffusion. That's diffusion of what? Yeah, diffusion of the phosphorylated Y. Right? And that's because we have. The cells here, they find, themselves in this, they find themselves in the bad environment. They, they rapidly bind the repellent, or they, they quickly phosphorylate key Y. But then Y is going to be formed at one of the poles. Because actually, there's, there's actually clustering of these receptors uh, at the poles of the cell. And incidentally, um, we're not going to be talking about that here. But that's, uh, there, I think there's, there's strong experimental and theoretical evidence that this actually increases the sensitivity. And indeed, people have used uh, kind of simple icing type models to try to understand how the coupling between the binding of repellents on this, uh, on what's essentially almost like a crystalline uh, array of receptors, can allow uh, the, the array to do better than you'd be able to do as an individual. We're not going to get into that here. But uh, in any case, there's, there's receptors at the poles. And I don't know if it's both poles or one pole, but one of the poles or the other. And that's where key Y is phosphorylated. Okay. But then you can see that these, these flagella are distributed all around the cell. Right, so you have to diffuse from, say, the pole to uh, the site of, uh, of, the, uh, of the flagellar motor in order to get a, uh, in order to cause it to go clockwise and then cause a tumble. Okay. Yeah. So you need only one motor? Yeah, so you actually only need, yeah, you only need one motor to get, uh, to get the tumbling. Right? And so then you, know, you may not have to diffuse all the way to the other end, but so and of course, diffusion is random. No. Uh, and we'll note that, uh, that 0.1 seconds is around the time that it takes for a protein size object to diffuse across the volume of, of a bacterial cell. Right? We did that calculation a couple weeks ago. Right? Okay. So 0.1 seconds is indeed, so the rate limiting step is indeed this step right here, which is diffusion um, of um, key y the phosphorylated version of it. Okay. All right, now, we may not get too much into the models here, because you did read about them. But I, I will just kind of sketch out 
sort of what you might call the fine-tuned model, and then uh, the key assumption that goes into this uh, into this robust model. Okay. Now, what's what both models assume, and indeed what was what's known in uh, you know what was known from previous work, was that uh, key R uh, is present at at small number, right? So key R. There might be around 100 proteins in the cell. Okay. And what does this mean about, about the activity of key R? What is it that we're, uh, it doesn't actually have to quite mean it, but what is it that, how, what, how uh, what's that? Okay, so yes, yeah, something is high, and, and what what is typically uh, what is assumed is that key R uh, acts uh, at saturation. Key R. Uh, okay. But what do we mean by saturation in, in this in these models? Right. Does it does it mean that if we add more key R, then the rate of methylation doesn't increase? And I should have put a little methyl group here. Okay. Yeah. All right. There, there, there's, there are multiple things you might mean by accent saturation. All right. And in the models that you read about last night, is what it means that if we increase the number of key R, that it, it doesn't change the, the rate of methylation? Yes or no? Ready? Three, two. One, no. Right? And what they mean is something rather different, which is that if we plot or if we, if we calculate the change in the concentration of the methylated X. Now, we're calling this whole thing XM, methylated X. And this is just X. Okay. Right, the assumption is that we have the meth, uh, X is being methylated at a rate that is, um, this is not, there's no michaelis menten term. And what, what, if we were to write this as it not being saturated, what would we be writing? What, what is it acting on? Um, yeah, right. It's, it's the, it's the non-methylated, it's not the methylated X. So indeed, if we were to write this, we're assuming that this is at saturation, as they say. But, any time that you see something like this, you have to ask, well, what, what, what would be the alternative? Right? And the alternative would be to include a term that looks kind of like just x over some k plus x. Because r is acting on the unmethylated x. Okay? We're not including that. What that means is that we're assuming that, uh, that this thing is, is saturated. Okay? That the concentration of x to be acted on is significantly larger than uh, the Michaelis constant there. You know, and of course, this is related to the amount of, of R, because as, R, as we get more and more R, then eventually we'll remove some of this x, and then we'll get into the non-saturated regime. Okay? So the, the statement, these two statements are related, but not the same thing. Okay. Now. The, there's also some rate that the phosphorylated version of, of B removes the methyl groups. And that's indeed just going to be this Michaelis constant. Okay. Okay. All right, this is, and this is going to be, this is uh, for the, the fine tuned model. All right, the robust model looks very similar, but. This is the simplest kind of manifestation of, of this model. Okay. Now, once we're writing this down, it's useful to make sure that we can keep track of what's actually happening over the course of perfect adaptation. Okay. Okay. So now, let's imagine first that, okay, uh, that an attractant arrives. Okay. That's going to change the activity of x. And when we say activity, what we mean is the, the rate that it's going to phosphorylate 
uh, both b and y. Okay. So let's just make sure that we know this direction. This. Okay. So okay, we add an attractant. All right. Does this? Okay. We'll say add. All right. What does this do? Does it make activity go up or down? All right, I'll give you 15 seconds to make sure that you kind of understand the workings of this, of this network. And this is activity of, uh, of this, of x, this complex x. All right, do you need more time? All right, let's see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. OK. All right, so we got a majority of the group is saying that it should go down. OK. Well, let's just follow the logic. All right, so we imagine an attractant binding. If the activity goes down, that means that we get less of the phosphorylated key Y. All right, that means we get less propensity to tumbling which means that we keep on going further. OK, that sounds reasonable. Right. Any questions about that logic? Yes? OK, right. So we, yeah, we haven't said anything yet about B. And that's, what, that's, what we're, that's what's going to happen next. And that's actually uh, that's the slow time scale. Right? So what we have in here is that we were kind of at this steady state tumbling frequency of kind of one per second. We add an attractant. Tumbling frequency goes down because of what we just said. Okay. But now there's going to be this longer time scale process whereby we get, uh, we get recovery, right? where we come back to this steady state tumbling frequency. And, then, and that's going to involve uh, ac um, action on key B. Okay. All right. All right, so what happens is that uh, the attractant causes less of the phosphorylated key Y, but it's also going to cause less of the phosphorylated key B. All right, now, that, that, that means that we're going to, uh, and key, remember, the phosphorylated key B is what's removing the methyl groups. Okay? So if we have less flux going to the left, but we have the same, we didn't, at that moment, we don't have any change in the flux going to the right. All right, so key R is still acting on the same unmethylated x's that, that it was operating on before. Right? So it's the same flux to the right, less flux to the left. Right? So we get the, uh, there's a net accumulation of the, of the methylated uh, receptor, which we are calling x. Okay. Right? So the key thing here is that, and it's this methylated receptor that has more activity. Right? It's the methylated, in this model, this unmethylated version actually doesn't have any activity. So then if we get more of the methylated X, then over time, we get a buildup of the methylated X. And that causes the activity to come back up. Okay. Now, of course, there's a question of, um, I, I just said that it comes back up. But I didn't say that it comes back up exactly to its original tumbling frequency. I didn't say that it necessarily displays perfect adaptation. Okay. And that's because in this model, the perfect adaptation arises as a result of what we call fine tuning, because it only happens if all of the parameters are just so. Okay? And, and in Uri's book, he, he describes a typical condition where that would be the case. And the problem is that if you, you can always fine tune for some concentrations of everything, key R, key this, key that. But then if the concentrations change, then you're no longer uh, fine tuned correctly. You were fine tuned for a different world. And now you're not, you know, now, and that's the definition of being fine tuned, is that if things change, you're no longer fine tuned. You're just fine, you know, you're finally off tune, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, so th so th this is the problem with the fine tuned model: is that you can get it right for a given for a given concentrations of everything. You can always find what numbers, you know, this is V B, and then uh, and then there's going to be uh, right. And we're gonna, you know, you can talk about the activities of X M given the previous attractant concentration, the new one, and so forth, but. It's not going to be fine-tuned if you change anything else, like you change concentration of R, for example. Okay. And I'm happy to go through that kind of the math and so forth. 
uh, you know, maybe after, after class if anybody's curious. But it's really uh, precisely what, what Uri did. So I, maybe I won't get into it now. Uh, but the, the question then is, well, how is it that you might change this model in order to make it, uh, make it robust? And, uh, and, and the change is, is somehow surprisingly uh, simple, which is that you want, what you want is you want key B, instead of just acting on any old methylated X, you want it to act only on the, uh, the methylated X that is in you know, what is, is sort of in what we would call this active state, where it's actually able to, to do uh, either of these, able to catalyze either of those reactions. Okay, so the notion is that you know, if you have this methylated X, then it's, it's kind of over a very fast time scale. It's switching between what we call an a, some active state and some inactive one. And it's really only in the active versions that key B is able to act on and, and cause uh, and remove the methyl group. And this is, on the one hand, kind of a clever thing that allows it to implement, implement this integral feedback. On the other hand, it's a little bit of a, um, it's sort of like pulling a bunny out of a hat, right? Because it also, you feel like, well, I mean, these, these things are you know, maybe happening over microsecond time scales. It's hard to know I mean, exactly that. I mean, how, how would you actually experimentally confirm that this is precisely what's going on? And I think that here it's, it, it, it's a little bit subtle because you can, show, you can maybe show that, indeed, the rate of, um, of this demethylation is proportional to the activity here, right? But you don't necessarily have access to all of the molecular dynamics that are taking place over microsecond time scales, right? So I think that you can uh, you can get you can kind of do measurements that are that give you confidence that this is maybe what's going on, but you can't quite you know 100% nail it because of the nature of these molecular fluctuations. Okay. Right. So. Um, Right, so the, the idea there is that, yeah. yeah. If we add, if we say that there's this rapid shuttling between the so-called active and inactive methylated guys, so this, this is just indicating that it's, it's what we call active, able to catalyze this and this, right, then, uh, then this, ends up, this ends up being equivalent to integral feedback where you, uh, where you'll always get uh, where you'll always get perfect adaptation. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the idea is that we imagine that we're this receptor X. You know, it's key W key A. Yeah. And now, whether it's uh, let's say it's bound to something, right? It still is going to be it's bound to an attractant, right? That the attractant. The way, that it, the way that the attractant influences its activity, and it has to influence its activity if it's going to do anything, right? that what we assume is the way that it's doing it is that it's, uh, it's changing the, the sort of fraction of time that I'm in some active confirmation where I can actually do work versus the inactive confirmation where you know, I'm taking a break. Right? So when you get the attractant, then you spend more of your time in this active confirmation where you're, in this case, phosphorylating proteins. Uh, and and that's, that's sort of the mechanism through which an attractant or repellent or whatnot influence it, you know, actually transmits its signal. Right? And indeed, it has to do something. Right? So the idea that, that, I mean, I would say nothing that we're discussing would work at all if we don't allow the signal to be transmitted somehow through this receptor. Right? So there is a sense that this activity has to be a function of the things out there. Right? And, and the, the sort of uh, the assumption that goes into the perfect adaptation is really that um, that the rate of demethylation is proportional to uh, that kind of active fraction. Okay. And then you can argue about how kind of discrete these entities have to be in order for the mechanism to work and so forth. But um, but certainly there has to be some way that that binding of an attractant leads to and we decided was less activity, right? OK, yeah, so the idea is that we're typically maybe assuming that the unmethylated guy has no activity, so it doesn't do any, uh, any of this phosphorylation. 
Whereas the methylated guy has, you know, has some activity. And, and you can argue about, you say, oh, that it's, you can characterize it by some rate of activity or some fraction of the time that it, it is in this active state that is doing something. And now the question, are, and indeed this ends up, well, you, you can see here that in this model, because you're directly acting on the active XM, then the steady state activity is you can get from just setting this equal to 0 and that there's some, uh, some number, right? Okay, but then the question is, how long does it take to come back to that steady state. And that's where we, that's where we get differences as a function of, of the concentration of key R. Okay. Right. Because what's happening always is that we have some kind of cycle here where key B is removing the methyl groups, groups key R is adding them back. Right. So you can imagine that if you have more key R than a steady state, you get more moving to the right, but it's, say, say you have to have the same moving to the left, right? Because it's steady state, it's equal. Right, so the more key R you have, the faster this thing is going around. Okay. And that means that the more key R that you have, the more rapidly that you'll get this um, perfect adaptation. Okay. So the experiment that, that Uri did, that I think is very nice, is he directly modulated the amount of key R, and he looked at this adaptation time. And he found this kind of came down. Whereas if you look at the, uh, the steady state uh, tumbling frequency, uh, this, this came up. Whereas uh, the degree of perfect adaptation, say the ratio or the error in this thing, um, perfect adaptation was always um, kind of correct in the sense that it always came back to its original uh, its original value. Okay. So, sorry, you yeah. were saying um, it has some activity, but it, uh, it only affects, it only controls GP when uh, the factor is down, right? And it only um, controls GY also when the factor is down. No, okay, so the attractin or the repellent can, be, can bind to either the methylated or the non methylated, right? But the point is that it's the only. No, so uh, you're, you're talking about, oh, OK. Uh, so it's really that the methylated state can phosphorylate either key B or key Y. But this is um, regardless of whether the attractant is bound, uh, bound or not. The attractant will influence the rate or the activity oh, the that this happens. Right. And given this, this model, you can see that okay, if you have more key R, then at steady state, you're going to have more activity. Right? More activity corresponds to more phosphorylated key Y and more tumbling. Right? So an increase in the tumbling frequency. Where which concentration? The ligand concentration. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Because that's what you know, Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. So the idea here is that if if we start out without any attractant, then um, okay. So first of all, yeah. So let's imagine we're at we're at steady state. There's no attractant or little attractant. Now we're of course the flux is to the left and the right are the same. So there's some methylated, some not. No, no but I agree. Like the mechanics is just like okay. in the actual like if you write an equation. Like, Oh, right, right. Yeah, right. So the idea is that when you get when you when you bind an attractant, that's going to change. Uh, that's going to change the uh, activity of the methylated. So it's going to change, for example, the, the fraction that are that are active. And it decreases the activity, right? In some sort of 
Yeah, there's some, right, and you know, and of course, uh, we haven't specified what that function, but the idea is that it leads to a rapid decrease in activity, which corresponds to a, a rapid decrease in this fraction that are active, Xn star. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so the, the last thing that I wanted to do is, is say something about what this means for, um, for individuality. Um, in particular, let's imagine that um, we have a population of uh, a clonal population of bacteria. And, and the question is, how in what ways will they be similar or different? Okay. So now we can just imagine an experiment where I take a population of cells with exactly the same genetic code, right? And I go and I measure, for example, the tumbling frequency across this population. Okay. All right, so now what we can do, all right, so we can talk about, we measure F1, F2, F3, all right, Fn. OK, so these are the tumbling frequencies across N cells. Okay, this is um, n, I you know, we will say genetically identical cells. The question is, will we get the same tumbling frequency? Right, well, are, are, should these things be the same? And if not, why not? Okay. All right, so let's just do our little votes. All right, we have should they be the same or should they be different? All right. Do you understand the question? All right. Let's vote. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. Well, OK. Yeah, that's fair. OK. So at least a majority of people are saying they should be different. And wh why might that be, somebody? <laughs> right. For example, we might have variation in the concentration of key R. Now, this variation is, is sort of a natural result of just fluctuating this or that, right? But it's, it's a little bit similar to the experiment that Uri did, where he, he actually, in this case, has actually put key R under the control of, uh, of an inducible promoter, where you could just add IPDG and drive expression, and then just measure like, the mean of these things across the population. But even at a single, even if you try to have everything be the same, you'll have some variation, right? which we found if for small numbers of proteins could be large, right? So that variation will transmit itself into variations in both the adaptation time and the tumbling frequency. Okay. And this is uh, indeed what this was observed as early as 1976. All right, so uh, there was a paper in Nature, 1976, by um, by Jim Sputich and Dan Koshlin. So Sputich uh, went on to study a number of these molecular motors. Uh, in particular, uh, he, he studied many of these myosins. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, he, he wrote this uh, classic paper in 76 called uh, Non-Genetic Individuality, Chance in the Single Cell. Okay. What he did is uh, they, uh, right, so they, they looked at many, of the, you know, many different individual cells using kind of a multiple, you know, a few of those techniques that I told you about. And what they found is that some of the cells seem to be what they call kind of like twitchy, and some of them seem to be more, more relaxed, right? So the twitchy cells are the guys that were, um, ha had a larger tumbling frequency, right? So they wouldn't swim as far as the others, right? So they swim just a little bit, and then they change their minds, swim a little bit, change their mind, right? Uh, whereas, other, whereas other cells uh, had, had much longer kind of runs, even though they're all nominally identical, OK? Now, can somebody say, the time scale over which we would expect that personality to um, persist? Cell yeah, cell generation time. And why is that? Yeah, right. So this is, if this is key R, you know, over time, it's going to do some, you know, something. And so the typical kind of autocorrelation time should be kind of the cell generation time. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so the, what we call the typical time should be around the generation. Uh, so indeed, this is the same as humans, right? You know, we have a well-defined personality, and then we pass on some of our personality to our kids. Typical time scales generation, all right? So I, I'm teaching you guys super useful things in this class, all right? I don't want anybody saying anything else. Um, right. So I think, but I think that this is this is a neat example of how um, how different cells can have what you might describe as being you know somehow different personalities, but it arises for a very uh, very particular reason because uh, this. Information is being transmitted through uh, through this network. Okay? Now, despite the fact that they all have different key R concentrations, they all right, so they might have different tumbling frequencies and so forth, but they should all be able to display this uh, phenomenon of perfect adaptation. Okay. All right, so what we then see is that from the experiments and from some simple models, you can get insight into uh, how it is that this phenomenon of perfect adaptation might be robust to changes in the concentrations of different things, in particular key R in this case. Now, and key R is the dominant source of, of error because it's present in such small numbers. Okay. Now, in the last two minutes or so, I just want to remind all, everybody about the other context in which we studied robustness because it's a much simpler example. And it helps to clarify what we mean by it. Does anybody remember the other context that we have talked about robustness? Negative autoregulation, someone said, maybe? OK, good. All right. And, right. So if we have some uh, protein that is negatively autoregulating itself, right, then this, uh, this adds robustness. Right? And this is because we can say, all right, this is the, uh, this is the degradation term, alpha x, the production term, and the limit of being perfect, sharp, negative autoregulation it looks like this. So this is, uh, this is the production slash degradation. right? And here, this might be. Beta, this is a K, right? Then what we can talk about is how the steady state concentration of X here is, uh, is going to be K. And this thing is robust to variations in some things, but not other things, right? For example, it's robust to changes in alpha. That changes the slope. It's robust to changes in beta, because that just brings that up and down. But it's not robust to changes in K. So I think that any time that if you are confused about robustness, in particular thinking about uh, robustness in the context of chemotaxis gets you confused because of perfect adaptation being confusing, I think it's always good to come back and think about this because this is the most clear case where uh, you can talk about the, this is robustness of the steady state concentration of some protein against variations in alpha and beta, right? but not against K. So it reminds you that it's not that this level of x is robust against everything, right? but it's robust against some things. And you can make sense of which things it should be robust against, which things not. Right? All right, so with that, I think we're going to quit. I just want to remind everybody that uh, none, of the, uh, none of the work that we're talking about here in the context of chemotaxis in, and in the genetic network will appear on the exam. But uh, we may have a problem on kind of low run Reynolds number flow, maybe something like Stokes drag, diffusion might make an appearance. Okay? All right, good luck on the exam. I'll see you guys uh, on Tuesday.